join. Uh, thank you very much for being here on behalf of the animal law section of the Florida Bar. I'm uh, Greg Morton from the Executive Council. Uh, this is being brought to you by the Farmed Animal uh, Committee of the Animal Law Section. Uh, we uh, uh, had the good fortune of uh, uh, seeing Mrs. Ms. Howell's uh, presentation to the ABA a few months back and invited her to come and give a similar presentation to our group. Uh, Amanda is a managing attorney for the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Uh, she works on combating human uh, humane washing unconstitutional ag gag laws, something that we've uh, seen here in Florida and, and, and uh, looked at as a section. The animal agricultural industry's attack on plant-based foods uh, prior to joining ALDF, Amanda co-headed the food law practice at the Stanley Law Group and focused on state and nationwide class action litigation. For that, she served as an assistant director of litigation at the Center for Science and the Public Interest. Uh, Amanda has contributed two chapters to the book, What Can Animal Law Learn from Environmental Law, uh, which uh, those of you who uh, 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 went to FAMU Law School, you remember uh, uh, the editor-in-chief was a law professor down there before he moved out of state. So shout out to that book. Uh, and uh, she also worked with the National Association of Consumer Advocates Standards and Guidelines publication and the National Consumer Law Center's Class Action Manuals, among other publications. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Amanda. Thank you for being here uh, and giving us this presentation. And I will talk uh, well, about <laughs> Thanks so much for the introduction, Greg, and thanks so much for having me. Um, I am here to talk about the politics of plant-based, specifically the recent spate of laws at the state level that have been passed that kind of uh, serve to um, either ban the speech or prescribe the speech of plant-based producers like tofurkey or um, for plant-based meat products and for plant-based dairy products. Bear with me while I uh, share my screen. I've got some uh, PowerPoint that might help um, kind of provide context for some of these things. So let's see. Uh, can I get an audible if, if folks can see the uh, PowerPoint? We can see it. Perfect. And, uh, and no note screen, so it looks good. Great, <laughs> that's the goal. All right, so, um, so Animal Legal Defense Fund. Maybe I don't need to go over this, but uh, you know, this is our mission statement. And some people always ask when I give these presentations about uh, plant-based options, um, if it's not readily apparent, why does the Animal Legal Defense Fund care about uh, protecting the rights of plant-based for-profit producers? And I think it's pretty simple. Um, it's supporting plant-based producers and making sure that they can sell their products everywhere and making sure consumers can vote with their dollars and choose plant-based products. Um, I think that we're all hoping that that decreases the demand, the food demand for animal-based products. So I don't think it's even too attenuated of, a, of, a, of an impact, I guess. Um, so one of our actual strategic impact uh, goals is to support plant-based just for those reasons, because of course we wanna have people able to choose uh, non-animal-based uh, options um, for their meals. I think everyone probably here is familiar with your general uh, plant-based meat products and offerings. Um, these are just some principal display products or panels for different plant-based products. Um, the arrows are mine, but I did that to show just how many times per package, per PDP, you're seeing indications uh, that these products are plant-based and not sourced from uh, slaughtered animals. Um, I think it's pretty common sense, but that's because it's a feature, not a glitch. These companies are trying to distinguish their products from animal-based products. Those so are increasingly uh, realizing that their diets have an effect on the environment and their health and of course, animal welfare. So again, they're really doing everything that they can to separate their products out from meat products while using meat terminology helps these producers kind of tell the nature and contents of the products, tells consumers how to use them, the organoleptic uh, properties, you know, what it tastes like, how it smells, how it cooks, things like that. So actually the meat terminology for these products are very important to companies uh, 
being able to efficiently and effectively convey, you know, what consumers can expect in terms of flavor um, and, and uh, purpose of the products. Same goes for uh, plant-based dairy products, like uh, milk products, cheese products, things like that. Instead of, um, you know, plant-based, you know, ham style loaf or something, you'll have like plant-based milk or soy milk or something. So what we're basically looking at is a qualifying term something like vegan or veggie or plant-based or, you know, or the source of it, like soy or oat or whatever, plus a meat or dairy term like ham or sausage or milk or cheese. I think that's pretty clear. Um, so these products have been on shelves for a very long time. Uh, ALDF represents tofurkey in a couple of these lawsuits that I'll be chatting about. And tofurkey is about as old as I am. So it's been on shelves for several decades. We'll just say that by uh, more than like about four decades. Um, and these laws are something that's kind of new. So why are uh, meat producers and meat lobbyists and dairy lobbyists, which are actually the groups behind a lot of these laws, why are they so concerned suddenly about um, consumer confusion about these uh, terms being used for plant-based products? Um, I think just looking at kind of following the money and you look at the growth of the plant-based sector over the last like 10 or 15 years and it just has sh absolutely shot up. Um, these numbers are even a little bit older. I think dairy mil milk sales uh, have decreased even further and plant-based milk instead of like about 10% of the dairy liquid dairy market it's now like something like 15 or 18%. So um, I think that the dairy lobby and the meat lobby are increasingly seeing plant-based as a, a real threat and a real um, competitive threat to their market share, which you know, is concerning for them, but that is something that consumers should be able to choose. Um, plant-based meat and plant-based dairy products are uh, covered by the same laws as any other like food product. Um, FDA, USDA, so Plant-based meat and dairy products are covered by the FDA, not USDA. USDA does uh, like meat and poultry and things like that. The FTC and the FDA have a memorandum of understanding so that FDA covers basically like labels and labeling for, for products, for food products, and FTC governs everything else, kind of like marketing and things like that. Um, I, I included this because I just want everyone to see like these laws like the FDCA and FTCA and like state uh, unfair and deceptive facts and practices laws, these have been on the books for like, you know, 100 years or something. It's been a long time. Um, and they have always, these longstanding, longstanding laws have always banned things that are false or misleading in any particular. So whether you're a plant-based meat producer or like a, I don't know, a fruit snacks producer, you can't do anything with your label or with your marketing materials that would mislead consumers. There's like this like many layered level of law laws that already prohibit you from doing that. So frankly, we just like don't need any additional state laws that say, we're just trying to prevent consumers from being confused about plant-based products. Those laws already exist. Plant-based producers are already beholden to them. Um, so the other layer, I guess, of enforcement in case the producers are engaging anything and that would be false or misleading in any particular. There are also state protection, uh, consumer protection uh, and labeling laws. Like California has your unfair competition law and uh, CLRA, and they also have adopted a state version of the FDCA. So again, like state and federal laws, I guess if there's one takeaway over these two slides is state and federal laws already prohibit um, plant-based producers for engaging in conduct that would confuse consumers. Um, so if we already have those laws, why pass additional laws? I think that's a very good question. Um, just by way of boring the heck out of everybody and giving a little bit of a regulatory backdrop, because this is something that I'll be talking about going forward, um, especially in the federal context, uh, there's a lot of talk about standards of identity and statements of identity, and just to help everyone understand what the differences are. Standards of identity were part of the FDCA way back when it first got started in like 1938 or something. And it's basically like a recipe for a product so that you know you have to have certain ingredients and certain amounts, maybe even covers like the production or like processing of the product. Um, and FDA started out with saying, we're going to create standards of identity. That's what you can call products. And you can't call products 
that don't meet the standards, you know, those, those phrases or words. Uh, what FDA quickly realized was that there are hundreds of thousands of products out there. Uh, they're not going to be able to create formal standards of identity, including like formal notice and comment rulemaking for every single type of product. So you know, they're, they're like, okay, let's give up on that. Let's talk about you just just have truthful statements of identity, which is uh, covered under 21 CFR 102.5 and 101.3, I think. And basically, it just requires producers to have on the, that principal display panel that I mentioned the uh, like a name that truthfully conveys the nature and contents of the product to consumers. It can even have a fanciful name as long as the nature of the product is clear to consumers. The the stereotypical example is Nilla wafers, like. You don't have to say it's a cookie. Everyone knows what a Nilla wafer is. Um, so, and and importantly, uh, this is not something that FDA has has to tell our products to use. It's what the producers choose to use. Um, a while back, I was in a lawsuit against vitamin water, and I think the statement of identity that Coca Cola used for vitamin water was a nutrient enhanced water beverage. So if that gives you a, a sense of like just how creative you can be and just how permissive FDA is with statements of identity, um, I think that's a, a good example. Um, the thing about statements of identity that I think we've seen from looking at those uh, principal display panels, uh, plant-based producers who produce substitute or alternative products, again, have that qualifying term like vegan and then the like meat or dairy term sausage or cheese or something. Um, and that is what uh, the meat and dairy lobby have been saying to FDA, to USDA for a while now, and, and then also lobby at the state level saying that th that naming convention is cons inherently confusing to consumers. Um, the thing is, they're just kind of alleging that, and we have a lot of surveys that I'm going to walk you through that have, you know, engaged in like hard <laughs> empirical data and studies and they're the only ones that exist that I'm familiar with. The only evidence out there, empirical evidence out there shows that consumers are actually not confused about the differences between animal and non-animal like dairy and meat products. I mean, this it should be common sense because I think we all like see like when something is a tofurkey product, it says plant-based sausage. No one's buying that expecting, you know, like a, a dead animal, but here, here we find ourselves. So we, um, Professor Adam and Silka Feltz at the U University of Oklahoma did the study that I was, that I just like found online and you know they had some grant that they did and they were focused on the dairy side of things and here are some of their surveys. Um, in our uh, lawsuit defending the echoes that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, the Feltz is all we, that we commissioned them as experts in that case. They also did additional surveys. So this is their second survey. It's unpublished, but if someone is curious about it, I can uh, of course share the uh, publicly available expert reports in these cases. Um, so again, we had them test like Miyoko's products and uh, in particular. And again, they're finding that consumers are no more confused about plant-based food, food labels than they are about animal-based products. And in fact, Consumers have a harder time distinguishing between different types of animal-based milks or cheeses than they do between plant-based and animal-based dairy products. So, you know, it sounds silly, but their conclusions are people are fairly good at understanding simple adjectives on labels, um, which, I mean, we, we laugh at this, but again, we have like several constitutional challenges just about, about the names of plant-based products. Um, so that this was a survey done for the Miyoko's case. Uh, they did three more surveys for us for our pending Tofurky litigation. Um, and this was recently in 2022. The first survey was basically saying that, uh, no, that they couldn't find any evidence that consumers are confused about plant-based products and animal-based products, kind of similar to before, only they were testing plant-based meat as opposed to plant-based dairy. And in fact, sometimes people were better at answering questions about plant-based products than animal-based products. So again, Nobody's confused by the marketing conventions and the naming conventions that plant-based producers have been using for you know decades at this point. Their second survey was basically to see what would happen if um, like tofurkey products were to comply with these very prescriptive and proscriptive laws, either by removing meat terminology from their labels. So instead of calling it like a plant-based sausage, it'd be plant-based like tube or something, which is something that the uh, meat lobby has you know suggested plant-based producers use. Um, and then also to add additional disclosures, which is what some of these laws are doing, asking 
additional disclosures to be made on the PDP. And they found that changing the labels of plant-based products to add disclosures or to remove the ter those terms does nothing to increase consumer understanding. It actually may hurt consumer understanding of these products and what the nature and contents of the products are. Um, and they did a third survey and they basically you know, dug into how, how do consumers use these terms and how, do, how would a consumer describe these products? And they found that uh, for like a plant-based or a veggie burger, that's exactly how, what consumers understand. These are actually the common or usual names that consumers use for these products, uh, which is important when you're thinking about the FDA regulations that apply. Um, there's another survey out there that was done by Jared Gluckel at, at Cornell University and same kind of thing, uh, but this was mostly for plant-based meat products. And he also found, you know, similar to what the, the, the Feltz has found, but that actually omitting those words, those meat terms hurt consumer understanding. So again, like if you're a state and you're actually concerned about consumer confusion. First of all, there's no evidence of any consumer confusion. Second of all, the only evidence out there shows that removing these terms or like having additional onerous requirements beyond that already imposed by FDCA um, would actually like harm consumer confusion. So not only does it not exist, so you're kind of creating, it's like a solution in search of a problem, you are actually harming consumer confusion by these laws. Um, I've been mentioning this kind of throughout that this these laws that I'm you know chatting about uh, have come from the uh, you know the lobby branches like the U.S. Cattlemen's Association, their state affiliates like the Missouri Cattlemen's Association, like the Pork Council, uh, Farm Bureau, things like that. Um, same thing with the dairy side of things. The Na National Milk Producers Federation have like been harassing FDA and states for like decades saying that they shouldn't like plant-based produ producers shouldn't be able to use milk terms or cheese terms or dairy terms saying that that's basically proprietary this is just like some of the uh action taken by these lobbyists trying to convince you know folks at the federal level to do something to prohibit plant-based producers from using what they see as their you know meat and dairy terminology um and this is just some letters from like national milk producers federation you see how far back they go um, and the Cattlemen's Association petitioned USDA to prohibit plant-based products from using things like meat and beef. Um, and honestly, nothing really happened at the federal level and hasn't until very, very recently, which I'll chat about at the very end here. Um, so having been basically stymied at the federal level, um, these lobby groups turned to state level, um, where unfortunately they uh, got a lot more success. Um, first on the plant-based meat side of things, uh, Missouri was the first law to pass one of these laws. Um, and the Senator Sandy Crawford, who sponsored the bill, um, flat out told the press this came to her directly from the Missouri Cattlemen's Association. They basically wrote the bill and handed it to her. Um, and it's a very kind of like vague law. It just says that you can't uh, misrepresent a product as meat that's not derived from harvested production livestock or poultry. poultry. And you kind of wonder what that is. like. What does misrepresenting something as meat mean? Does that mean you can't use meat terminology? Does that mean you can't like create something in the shape or like image of it? Like would a plant-based hot dog be completely like banned because like that's misrepresenting something as meat? And you look at that very vague language and it's also like a sweeping ban on language and conduct. Um, plus the fact that this is a criminal law. So it was tasking like 115, 15 county prosecutors, 115 different folks. Uh, with the ability to throw the CEO of plant-based producer <laughs> products in jail for anything that they decided fell under the gambit of misrepresenting a product as meat, which seems crazy. Um, the next kind of spate of lawsuit or of laws that got passed were very similar to Arkansas and Louisiana's, which was you can't you anything that is it's everything that's prohibited is representing a product as meat when it's not. So you see it got rid of the misrepresenting, which is kind of key here. Um, Arkansas and Louisiana also had this very huge catch-all provision where it said they can't utilize a term that is the same or same as or similar to a term that has been used or defined historically in reference to a specific agricultural product. And you're like, what? Like, what does that even mean? Like, and and what are they trying to encompass? And what like the world of conduct that would fall under that? And like how vague that is? Like defined historically. Um, and and when we're looking at this, it's actually kind of 
knowing the facts of the uh, the people passing the law was interesting because I think it was in Louisiana. I don't remember if in Arkansas, but they were definitely trying to go after cauliflower rice in addition to plant-based uh, substitute products. And that's why it's like, this has been defined historically to be rice. So you can't say riced cauliflower, cauliflower rice, which I think is kind of hilarious. Again, they're like being the semantic police or something. Um, this is the Louisiana statute that was passed. And again, very similarly sweeping, similarly vague um, ban on speech. Uh, and I, I should say that the Arkansas and Louisiana laws uh, were uh, civil provisions, not criminal, but they were still like $500 and $1,000 per violation per day, which means that companies like Tofurky were facing like absolutely ruinous civil penalties. Um, they would be put out of business basically for even like having online marketing that would reach these states because these laws didn't just apply to the labels that, you know, were sold within the states, but also all marketing uh, materials nationwide. Oklahoma is a little bit different in terms of the type of law that they passed. Um, we look at it and the first part is very, this, very much the same. It's bans misrepresenting a product that is as meat that's not derived from harvested production livestock. Um, and that would apply again to online marketing, you know, print ads, all of that. Oh, now we see the cat. Sorry about that, guys. Um, and then the second part that's kind of bolded there, um, it kind of has a carve out or a safe harbor for products. Uh, labels are not in violation as long as the packaging displays that the product is derived from plant-based sources and type that's uniform in size and prominence to the name of the product. Um, and that's interesting because, yes, it's in some ways allowing for what already plant-based producers do, which is disclose that they're plant-based on their PDPs, but it's going so far as to regulate something that's already regulated um, by the FDA in its express preemption provisions uh, area of the FDA, and also uh, being kind of like overly prescriptive in terms of just telling producers exactly how to convey that they're, they're vegan, that uniform in size and prominence is problematic. Sometimes people like that, that that PDP, the front of package, is very valuable real estate. And we'd like to maintain the flexibility of producers to disclose that they're vegan in type that's like maybe even bigger, not uniform in size, but bigger than the name of the product or like separate or a separate call out or like maybe a big seal or maybe a fanciful name like chick apostrophe N. Like there are various ways to disclose that you're plant-based and this kind of like was uh, overly burdensome. And again, kind of saying that this applies to products sold within Oklahoma, uh, but it's really impossible for producers to avoid certain regions, especially when you use uh, third-party distributors, which I'll get into later because that implicates the dormant commerce clause, cause of action that we have. Um, the third case that I wanna, or fourth, I don't know, fifth, who knows at this point, uh, case I wanna talk about in a bit is the um, case that we had defending, or, well, we represented Miyoko's uh, kitchen. They received a, a warning letter from the California Department of Food and Agriculture telling Miyoko that they had to remove a lot of uh, claims from their labels and from their online um, website. Things like 100% cruelty and animal free, they were saying you have to remove that. They had to remove things like lactose free and cruelty free. But even their mission statement, revol revolutionizing dairy with plants, they said they had to remove because that was misleading people into thinking it was like related to like animal agriculture. My favorite and the most ridiculous one I would say is they said you had to remove this picture of a woman hugging a sanctuary cow uh, that lived on you know the Miyoko sanctuary that had been rescued from the dairy uh, uh, industry. Um, and most importantly, they said you should you are not allowed to use the term butter even when it said uh, cultured vegan butter, all in the same kind of like size and font, um, which was uh, a pretty ridiculous uh, ask and demand. Um, so these are the constitutional challenges that I'm referring to. So Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, all representing plant-based meat products. And the plaintiffs are uh, Tofurky, uh, GFI and uh, PBFA all kind of like separated out. And then uh, again, on the plant-based dairy side, we uh, had a case uh, representing Miyoko's kitchen um, that resolved in California. <clears throat> and so I guess I wanted to, uh, let's see. So the first amendment <laughs> is something that if we're, if we're paying attention here, bans on speech, even commercial speech, as long as it's truthful are, are not allowed. Commercial speech is protected under the first amendment. 
um, and that's the central Hudson standard. Um, so again, as long as it's truthful, not misleading, uh, if the government then has to show that it has a substantial government interest in restricting the speech and in, in having that ban on speech, and that restriction has to directly and materially advance the state's purported interest. Um, and further, the fourth prong is that restriction can't be more extensive than necessary to achieve the stated in state interest. Okay, so the first thing that I kind of want to uh, show here, just because I'm a bit of a, a jerk, is that substantial government interest, usually courts just like accept at face value what the substantial government interest is. Um, but then we have things like this, where the legislative history show that the substantial government interest being asserted is consumer confusion, confusion and, you know, preventing consumer confusion. But then we have quotes like this, where it's like, we just want to protect our beef brand. We're just trying to protect our product. Like we're, we're into, like we're protecting the industry. We work with the industry a lot. Um, so I think this definitely shows that the, uh, there's kind of like a post hoc rationale um, at, at the beginning. This is being sponsored by uh, meat and dairy producers to protect themselves. And then later on, when defending the law, the states are like, no, we're really concerned about consumer confusion. Um, so then hopping back to, uh, yeah, so that said, we're not even ha having to combat that. That's like nice color and background for understanding the, the, the impetus and the motivation of these laws. That said, the uh, third and fourth prongs of Central Hudson is really where the states have uh, fallen down hard, which is, you know, sure, even if we say, so everyone agrees, I think that these, uh, the language at issue is not inherently misleading. There are ways to use uh, meat terms for plant-based products that is not inherently misleading to consumers. Uh, you know, the uh, surveys and empirical evidence already show that. But happy to stipulate that there's a substantial government interest. And in fact, if they were concerned about consu consumer confusion, that is a substantial government interest uh, under Central Hudson. Um, the problem is, given that the states can't show their actually exists any consumer confusion with like the labels and marketing materials that like have been around for decades how can they show that passing these bans on speech further a goal of preventing consumer confusion they can't right and then one step further that fourth prong uh, a restriction a ban on speech is, is a pretty is pretty heavy stuff and we protect first amendment rights including uh commercial speech a ban on speech instead of, you know, I think that the quote is, you know, it's it should be more speech rather than less mm -hmm. to cure any con confusion. So absolutely banning speech is definitely more extensive than necessary to address any consumer confusion in this context, even if consumer confusion indeed existed. Um, so that hopefully kind of shows our, our stance on the, the First Amendment side of things. Um, reading those laws, to you all, um, I think it was pretty clear that they were very wide sweeping, very vague. Um, so we have, as one of our other causes of action, um, due process clause void for vagueness, because the statutes use language fail to provide people of ordinary intelligence a reasonable opportunity to understand like how to comply with the law. If you asked me, I don't know what representing a product as me encompasses. I don't know if plant-based sausage would would fall under that again like images of people like it, in theory could even ban the sale of these products at all because of like how they're designed to look and smell and taste and things like that and be used um I will say courts will interpret if they can uh any statute to read out any vagueness but again here we have things so broad that like representing as me or you know, name of the product or utilizing a term that's been defined historically, it's so vague that like they actually have not been able to provide any cabining or limiting provisions um, for these for these laws. Uh, hopping back to the Oklahoma case um, and the Oklahoma law, I, I mentioned that that is a speech re requirement instead of a speech ban, which means that we actually don't have a first, a very strong First Amendment uh, cause of action. So we, when we took over the case from the Institute for Justice, we actually uh, dropped the First Amendment because um, it would fall under a different level of scrutiny uh, because it was a re speech requirement, speech like the disclosure requirement uh, that falls under rational basis scrutiny instead of uh, intermediate scrutiny under Central Hudson, which applies for speech bans. Um, so instead. Um, the fact that that law kind of 
touches on areas that exist in the express preemption provision of the uh, uh, FDA's NLEA labeling provision, labeling uh, statute. Um, it has like 12, the, the express preemption provision has like 12 different areas where basically it's like everything that's covered and needs to be on that principal display panel. And they, they have that express preemption provision and it prevents uh, states from doing anything different from or in addition to what's required by the FDA. And that's so that, you know, there's a uniform labeling scheme so that com companies can know when they're compliant so they can sell their, their products across state lines and nationwide and kind of know that they're not going to be faced with a patchwork of laws. Um, that, that seems like just common sense. Um, and when states pass laws like Oklahoma did, um, that kind of touches on the statement of identity and, and has additional requirements for the statement of identity that runs afoul of the supremacy clause, uh, which is preemption provision. Um, so it, it's preempted by the FDCA. Uh, including in our first amendment uh, main lawsuits and the Oklahoma uh, kind of uh, preemption and, and due process lawsuit uh, or cause of action, we also have a dormant commerce clause uh, as a theory in these cases because um, I think it's pretty clear when you have a law that applies to marketing, especially in the world that we live in, it's actually impossible to prevent uh, like a consumer in Missouri or Oklahoma from going online and going onto like Toe Berkey's website. <laughs> um, so the first thing here is that it governs wholly extraterritorial conduct um, and conduct that, you know, even if consumer producers could try to avoid these markets, which for reasons about distributors and things like that, they, they absolutely can't, it's impossible, especially with online sales and things like that. They don't control where their products end up. And even if they spent millions of dollars trying to prevent it, they still could not have like geofencing or something for online content. Um, I don't know what that would mean. Like you would not be able to have banner ads or you'd have to have like something on the on your website being like, you're not at, click this box if you live in Oklahoma, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, that's crazy. Um, so again, governing wholly extraterritorial conduct is per se uh, just, uh, invalid under the Dormant Commerce Clause. So is anything that discriminates uh, between interstate and uh, interstate and inter interstate commerce. Um, so these laws are passed because these states have very robust uh, animal agriculture industries, um, and they were worried about plant-based, right? Um, I think Missouri is the only state that I'm aware of that has any plant-based producer based in the state. So of course, inherently, they're direct competitors with plant-based with plant and animal-based are competing for plate space or competing with consumers to, you know, for a meal, a consumer to choose them for a meal. So uh, it actually means that even though you wouldn't think about them being uh, like, benefiting in-state producers for out of, at the uh, burden of out-of-state producers, um, it actually does fall under that, under the Dormant Commerce Clause. And that's where we uh, also apply pike balancing. Um, basically, does, uh, it does it violates the Dormant Commerce Clause if um, the burden on interstate commerce, commerce is excessive in relation to the putative local benefits. Here we have very I mean, I would say no local benefit, again, because there's no uh, uh, existence of consumer confusion. So that's kind of like a pretextual government interest being asserted. So it's like zero government interest and zero harm that's being addressed against this like very heavy uh, burden on interstate commerce in terms of like creating a patchwork of laws and uh, having to change labels and things like that. So for both, um, per se uh, violations and for pike balancing. Uh, that's kind of like the, the rundown on why these, these laws run afoul of the dormant commerce clause. All right, um, I am going to now get to what's happened in these cases. I should have said at the beginning, if anyone has any questions, just go ahead and interrupt me. Um, I've, I know I've been like rambling a lot <laughs> about like FDA regulations and dormant commerce laws, which has probably put everyone to sleep, but feel free, especially talking about these cases here at the end to uh, go ahead and interrupt. Oh, I actually have this. Oh, I've got 20 minutes left. Okay, good. So I'll leave some time for questions at the end. Um, so in Arkansas, good news there, we filed our motion for summary judgment and they actually held that the law is unconstitutional as applied to Tofurky. Um, and I liked some of the quotes from the order, so I pasted them here. 
Uh, the state appears to believe that the simple use of the word burger, ham, or sausage leaves the typical consumer confused, confused, but such a position requires the assumption that a reasonable consumer will disregard all of the words found on the label. Uh, that's, uh, that's hilarious. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading from the permanent injunction. Um, yeah, oh, so we won the pr preliminary injunction and the permanent injunction. So uh, that was unconstitutional as applied to Tofurky. I think that what that means is the state's not going to seek enforcement against anyone, uh, any other plant-based producer. And as long as that plant-based producer is engaging in similar uh, naming conventions and marketing uh, representations as Tofurky, again, having this qualifying language, I think they're fine. Um, also that provision that I read about being like used historically or, or that craziness, that one was stricken <laughs> on a facial basis because it was so vague, which was very satisfying for me. Um, our, our Miyoko case, same thing. Uh, that was Judge Seaborg in the Northern District of California, and he gave us a really excellent order on our motion for summary judgment. He held that Miyoko's use of butter is constitutionally protected. Um, and here the state's sole asserted interest is avoiding consumer confusion because the record lacks material reasonably supporting the conclusion that removing those representations from Miyoko's labeling will in fact advance that to material, material degree, the state can enforce it. I will say that Miyoko's was also different because they didn't, the CDFA didn't pass an additional law. It was trying to uh, cite uh, federal regs to go after for uh, Miyoko's. We are not trying to like knock down existing federal regulations that prevent consumer confusion. It was the uh, way that they were using it. So that was an as applied constitutional challenge. Uh, and the court said as applied to Miyoko's, the state's uh, enforcement provision was uh, unconstitutional. So Miyoko can basically continue using the term butter and revolutionizing uh, dairy with plants, things like that. Uh, the only small, I guess, uh, carve out was the court said that hormone free wasn't in, wasn't inherent could be inherently misleading because there are uh, plant hormones and everything. Um, so I guess she could continue using it if she said no animal hormones or no cow hormones. Um, so we won that case as well. In Louisiana, uh, again, First Amendment ban kind of uh, posture. We won our motion for summary judgment. Uh, it was a really excellent order. The, the order struck the entire law down uh, on a facial basis as unconstitutional violation of uh, the First Amendment. Um, last week, we and the, and the state appealed up to the Fifth Circuit. Last week, we got our ruling from the Fifth Circuit, which was one of the crazier uh, rulings I've gotten in, in my career. Um, the Fifth Circuit vacated our win on the our motion for summary judgment. That said, the entire order agreed with us until the very last paragraph. And I'm going to explain why this, this Fifth Circuit order saying that we lost meant that we actually won. Um, because the court said, found, the Fifth Circuit said, Tofurky does have standing. Um, and that was what basically what the state brought up uh, on their on appeal was that Tofurky doesn't have standing. That was their only argument. Um, if you remember, the, the Louisiana law said that no person shall intentionally misbrand or misrepresent any food as an agricultural product blah, blah, by doing these following things, including selling a product under the name of an agricultural product or representing something as meat when it's not from slaughtered meat, basically. Um, the Fifth Circuit really took a hard look at that um, and said that even though Tofurky has standing, even though the law was clearly designed to apply to Tofurky, it went so far as saying that Tofurky's naming conventions are not misleading and they do a good job of you know, conveying truthfully what the contents are to consumers. Um, the Fifth Circuit, what it did was, um, oh, and here, here's kind of, I know this is a lot of text for, for a PowerPoint, but the Fifth Circuit got really hung up on that intentionality, that like seemingly center requirement of like no person can intentionally mislead by doing these things. But if you do any of those things, like this, it's like circular logic. If you do any of those things, you are inherently, by the terms of the law, engaging in intentionally misleading someone. Um, so this is kind of the, the court's discussion of that point. Um, and it says basically, you know, there are two ways to read this intentionality requirement. In the end, they decided though that the state had actually given us a narrowing provision um, such that. Uh, they kept the law, the law is not stricken, but the state can only enforce law against folks, against plant-based producers, if 
the state can show that they are intentionally trying to trick consumers, which is, <laughs> I mean, an incredibly narrow reading. And, and basically they read that law almost out of existence. And there are more robust uh, consumer protection laws on the books. There are more robust like federal laws on the books that prescribe, that, that give guidance to uh, conduct. So I guess what the meat producers tried to do is, you know, have this law that would ban speech and what they ended up with was a law that isn't even as strong as consumer protection law. Um, so, cause again, I don't think they'll be able to find anyone to go after uh, because plant-based producers are using those uh, qualifying terms and because they are trying to, trying to distinguish their products and not trying to trick consumers into thinking they're dead animals. So it's kind of like a lot, it's like we won by losing or I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so it actually wasn't the, the end of the world. So, um, so far, I would say that we are, you know, three out of three on successes. Um, and in Missouri and Oklahoma, those cases are still pending very much so. Um, also, just flag one more thing. Uh, I know I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to leave about 15 minutes for questions. Um, there's an unrelated case, like as a not brought by the Animal Legal Defense Fund, but the Ninth Circuit already looked at uh, these naming conventions because there was a consumer protection class action. Uh, against uh, almond milk products. And the Ninth Circuit said that no reasonable consumer would be misled by the use of almond milk on, pack, on products. No one, no one thinks that it's milk. Um, and what's more, uh, reasonable consumers don't think that like two products with different uh, ingredients would have the same nutritional content, which is very helpful when we look at what's happening on the federal level right now. Um, so all this stuff has been on the state level. That's not to say these lobbying groups have given up at the federal level. And about a year and a half ago, FDA said that, you know, announced these, these food program guidance under development, and they indicated that they would be giving guidance documents for the labeling of plant-based milk alternatives and plant-based alternatives to animal-derived foods, which, you know, I think is plant-based meats. Um, so unfortunately, that just came out. Uh, our comments, ALD has been submitting comments to that that are due in a few days here on Monday, I think. Um, the good news about, and the FDA's guidance that they, draft guidance that they uh, sent out was so far just for plant-based milk products, but I expect something similar will happen for plant-based meat products, which I'm dreading because on the good side of things, FDA did confirm that the common or usual names for these products are things like soy milk and almond milk. So we can use milk or meat, presumably, terminology for plant-based products. The really terrible thing is FDA, in their guidance document, made like a soft recommendation. So it's, it's going to be hard to bring uh, an Administrative Procedure Act challenge against this. They recommended that plant-based milk alternatives that use milk in their name also on their principal display panel disclose how they're nutritionally worse than their meat, their normal milk, their animal milk counterparts. As in, like, you know, this percentage less calcium or this percentage less magnesium, vitamin D, or what have you. And they're saying that that statement is voluntary, but what I'm going to expect is that. Um, private plaintiff's attorneys will try and say that consumers were misled and thought that these products had the same uh, essential nutrients as their animal milk counterparts, um, which, as I said, has already been dealt with by the uh, Ninth Circuit. But now that we have this uh, position from FDA, I think it's like deeply concerning. I will say also that FDA, that's, this is an unprecedented recommendation from FDA. FDA is basically asking a competitor product to say we're worse or in these ways than this competitor product on their own labels. Um, that's like saying, asking, you know, white bread to say like, we're worse than wheat bread for these reasons. And we have this much less fiber on their own products, on their own PDPs, um, which is, uh, I, I think, incredibly uh, problematic. I think that, you know, FDA wading into which products are healthier or not. Um, Plant-based products don't have any cholesterol, for instance. Um, I, I think that it is going beyond their their statutory mandate in an incredibly problematic way. So, been rambling a lot. I think uh, it's about quarter two, so I want to leave some time for questions. Um, so, yeah, please, I'll I'll stop sharing actually, so we can actually go on camera if we feel like it. Uh, but yeah.
go ahead, shoot, yeah. I guess. <laughs> I mean, um, uh, thank you very much. This is all very interesting. I, I don't think I can turn my camera on since I'm not the host anymore. But um, before I before I uh, read these questions that are in the chat, I'm going to jump in line and 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 uh, ask my questions. Starting out with a, a joke, I, I liked the Louisiana laws reference to uh, shrimp carcasses. So if you ever go <laughs> want to go on the offensive and and require these meat based companies to label their products. Uh, accurately, maybe we can just add the word carcass to all. Oh, of, <laughs> all I like it. Yeah. <laughs> but my 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 serious question is: uh, so I mean, there's there's room in this for for attorneys like yourself to do things like that. One of the things that the section is obviously involved with is educating folks about this, because when you hear the arguments and the equities on these sides of things, it's very hard for anyone to say that, yeah, that, that, that any of these concerns are legitimate or any of these laws are legitimate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where, and and so I feel like I'm plugged into things. I've read about Miyoko's and, and the Just May and things, but it seems like a lot of these companies are talking out of both sides of their mouth. And so you can go into the grocery store now and see Unilever's Hellman's mayonnaise. It's vegan and things like that. <laughs> What's... Yeah, okay. Uh, aside from joining the ALDF, uh, what's the best way for consumers to educate themselves on this or follow this litigation uh, uh, so, that, so that, 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 that they truly know and are educating themselves that, hey, this is what's going on with some of these laws? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I would say that in addition to being educated about some of these laws, which, you know, again, if you go on our website, you know, we tend to track these things. We're tracking the, uh, you know, the bills that are being passed. I, I would say that I would I'd ask folks to go one step further. And when you see things like, you know, this FDA draft guidance, uh, ELGF is submitting comments, but it is also very much designed for individuals to submit their own comments about the draft guidance. So, you know, write in, even if it's just a paragraph or, or a page. And I think the deadline actually just got extended. So when I said it's due Monday, I lied. I think we've got a little bit more time. So folks can go on um, the FDA and I'm, I'm happy if, if anyone wants to email me, it's uh, ahowell at aldf.org. I'm happy to send that link um, and just, you know, say that this is crazy that you're asking uh, competitors to compare themselves to, you know, animal-based milk for some reason. Um, really holding animal-based milk up as like some gold standard for health is absolutely crazy, especially given how most people can't digest it. And longitudinal studies show that it actually causes osteoporosis. Um, so, you know, FDA trying to still encourage people to like with this guidance against plant-based milk to, uh, you know, instead choose animal-based milk is crazy. So that's one thing you can do right there, like right into FDA. Uh, when you see the FDA guidance come down for plant-based meats, like same thing, right in, um, you know, tell FDA they're being crazy. Uh, if Florida, uh, if your state passes any bills or is considering any bill that prescribes uh, the, the conduct or language of plant-based meat or milk producers such that they would not be able to use those terms, even with like qualifying language, yeah, call your senators, like write to them, like, <laughs> you know, testify at like the hearing. Um, the thing that I've learned uh, looking through the legislative history here is that no one seems to be aware of these things and they're passing uh, very easily, I guess, because the only people who have this on their radars are supporting the bill, you know, it's the lobbyists. Um, so if individual citizens and residents went and said, why are you wasting my taxpayer dollars passing these laws that are just going to be stricken, you know, as unconstitutional. And then you're going to have to fight them and spend hundreds of thousand dollars on legal fees defending this unconstitutional law that's basically being passed at the behest of one industry in order to attack another. That's not like a good use of, uh, that, that's an unconstitutional law. Laws, you know, you can't, just because you're in the government, can't pick a favorite industry and support that one by attacking another one. Um, and, you know, I, I would like to not to have to do these lawsuits, honestly. I, I find them very <laughs> enjoyable. They're very fun. We have been winning them, but like, hey, it'd be great if these bills didn't get passed. So I guess uh, taking a, a further step on the legislative side and preventing them from being passed uh, in Florida would be great too. <laughs> uh, so yeah. <laughs> we, we will definitely uh, keep an eye on things down here and, and uh, 
do that. <laughs> Let me try to get through as many of these questions because they're rolling in now. Uh, first one, plant-based meats are only a fraction of the market share compared to animal products and plant-based stocks are low. So given this, why is the animal ag industry so concerned about plant-based meats taking over, especially in Midwest agricultural states? Yeah, I think I would, I would first of all, uh, query if like the, the stocks are low. Like, so if you're talking about like beyond meat and stuff, like maybe they were overvaluated, but like, I think that it's still a very much growing market. Like when I went vegan, what, 14 years ago, you never had vegan meat products on menus and now you do. So like, well, it's, I will acknowledge it's growing, the meat side is growing slower than the milk side, which is now, you know, like 18% of the market share for liquid milks. Um, it is still very much growing. I will say that when Missouri first passed its law back in 2018, um, I think that was right around the time that Beyond Me had like gone public and like, they were just like, this is like a billion dollar industry. And also um, they were very concerned about cell cultured meats too. I think that was one of the like the, the catalysts right. for these laws. Um, so I think they're trying to get out ahead of it. Um, you know, they have deep pockets. These lobby groups are, you know, pretty powerful and they have multiple fronts. This is just one front. Um, so they're, you know, hamstringing their the competition. Sorry, no pun intended. Um, but yeah, for sure, they're they're trying to make it harder for plant-based meat products to do business just to like preserve their own market share. I think other things that they're doing, you know, is like preserving um, their subsidies in these like, especially like those like ag heavy states. And I guess the, the question is interesting because it's like, of course it's gonna be, they're gonna have more success getting legislators who are sometimes members of the Cattlemen's Association themselves. Of course, they're gonna have more success passing these unconstitutional laws. Uh, in those states that where they are, you know, their constituents, they're beholden their constituents and their constituents are, you know, going to be the same like pork and, and cattle producers. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's in those states that these laws are cropping up exactly. The ones with their GDP is heavily uh, beholden to animal agriculture and not like the states where it's not as beholden to animal agriculture, you know, like I doubt we'll see this in Delaware or something, for instance. <laughs> Well, and it's interesting that you mentioned uh, I became vegan 25 years ago, and I feel like we're living yeah. in the day of wine and raises. I mean, uh, I went to, this is Florida specific, went to Publix yesterday, and they had two different vegan subs you could choose from, so I do yeah. think the market yeah. share is growing. <laughs> I used right. to, yeah, I feel like that like cranky person like shaking their head was like, I used to not, I used to just eat French fries when I went out and I didn't have any <laughs> options. And now everyone has like multiple, you know, burger options that are plant-based and things like that. So it's lovely, but yeah, it definitely means that they are, you know, even if it's like 5% of the market share or something like that, that's still like that represents a, a hit to their bottom line. So yeah. Uh, next question, how often do meat manufacturers use laws to enjoin others versus how often are these laws actually attempted to be enforced versus how often do targeted industry businesses seek to enjoin enforcement? In other words, what is the breakdown on frequency of these different types of litigation? That's a good question. Yeah. So um, because this was on our radar, like way back when the first one was passed, um, there is not a single, There, I think there are like 17 on the books. Uh, a lot of these laws have carve outs for plant-based products that allow for and it was like it doesn't apply if you any in any way indicate your plant-based which of course everyone's doing so we're not concerned about those laws but the ones that we are concerned about there are pending constitutional challenges so in terms of harm that it's already done of course like plant-based producers and distributors are like scared if these were to be enforced and it has already caused some harm sufficient to confer standing including like chill of speech um but going you know until they're enforced they haven't cause any harm in because these laws are, are, you know, so we either have preliminary injunctions in place or we've got promises from the state to refrain from enforcing during the pendency of the litigation. So until basically what we're saying is until the states see how the litigation shakes out, they're not actually trying to enforce the laws. Um, so we haven't seen any enforcement yet, uh, except for, you know, in, in the Mio Gross case, that was a different thing because it wasn't a, a affirmative law. It was like using current law and that was an enforcement position. Um, hopefully that kind of taught CDFA a lesson and they won't be targeting plant-based in the same way going forward. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Um, no enforcement as of yet, but that's because of the pending litigation. Uh, and I, yeah, <laughs> I would be really curious to see how these things 
uh, oh, I, I want to say one more thing. Um, we ALDF did not necessarily target laws that focused solely on cell cultured. And that's because um, the FDA and USDA, since these laws have been passed, signed a memorandum of understanding, basically saying that USDA was going to engage in pre-market label approval for cell cultured products when they hit the market. So those are inherently going to be preempted, these other laws. So I think they're like kind of covered. I'm not as concerned about those. If that makes sense. Okay, sorry. Went off on another very, ramble. But yeah. <laughs> very, very good. Yeah, and we're coming into a close, so we may not have anything. I do want to mention uh, 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 several folks have asked about the CLE number. Uh, uh, talk to Ricky beforehand, and we will be emailing that CLE number out to folks. I'm hoping that we can also get some administrative uh, credit for board certification, since you talked to, about uh, regulatory and, and labeling laws as well. But we will uh, <laughs> send that out to the uh, to anyone who registered and attended um, after the fact. So that that is coming. Uh, looks like uh, one question and then a, a comment that has a question in it. Does ALDF have any lobbyists in Florida? I mean, that's not in my practice area. I'm in the civil litigation program. I doubt it, though. I knew yeah. at, at one point the section worked with uh, a lobbyist in Florida, but I'm not sure if they were housed here, if it was someone yeah. from the national group, but. That's a good question. I would hop on our website. We've got our legislative affairs program and it's, you know, it's a hand, it's a handful of excellent people. They cover the whole United States. So if you have uh, targeted questions, you know, I think there's like an info at ALDF. You can ask that um, and they can probably point you in the right direction. Um, in terms of like, you know, if anyone's interested in taking like direct action in the legislative sphere. Um, and uh, just one more time, if anyone has any questions, if anyone, you know, wants any of the links or FDA or otherwise, my uh, email is ahowell at aldf.org. All right. Uh, let me, I think we got time for one more, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, can we go on the offensive and given the FDA guidance on those compares to ask them why doing, uh, what we ask that meat labels also include a carbon emissions or carbon footprint comparison. Mm -hmm. It feels like we were playing defense. So putting an ag on defense fighting labels requiring a high carbon footprint or some label mm -hmm. relating to the environment might be a good idea. Yeah, that's, I completely agree. And I am very sick of being on the, the defensive side of things. Um, an offensive type of thing uh, would be a citizen petition or a request for formal rulemaking on these things. And frankly, you know, there's, significant agency capture. I don't think that there's like a, a high chance of FDA taking us up on those types of suggestions. That said, I do think it would be nice to file something like that just because it points out kind of the, the hypocrisy, you know, they're saying consumers can't even just like read the side panel and find out like in the information panel and the nutrition facts panel, the nutrients. Um, and you have to say this disparaging stuff on the PDP, like I feel like consumers are are care you know care increasingly about things like like this person said the carbon footprint and stuff and having disclosures required on PDP would be, yeah, <laughs> and that yeah. and that's something that's information they can't find anywhere else you know on the PDP, PDP or otherwise so yeah that would be a good thing I agree. <laughs> well, and I feel like some of the national organizations ALD have concluded have done some things where about greenwashing and and. Mm -hmm. And things like that, where all these companies are talking out of both sides of their mouth. So we're very mm -hmm. humane in our <laughs> of animals, yeah. and, and when you learn the truth of it, it's not the case. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we do thank have you. our humane washing and greenwashing cases that do yeah. you know take the fight to the the individual companies, the meat and dairy companies themselves. But sorry, <laughs> thanks so much, Greg. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your presentation, and uh, uh, I think that uh, everyone got a lot out of it. So. Um, we uh, will go ahead and end the seminar now and put it up. If uh, you have folks that uh, didn't get to attend that you know, look for an email from us. We'll also include a link at some point to our section members. So with that, I will go ahead and say thank you very much, Amanda, and uh, uh, talk to you all again soon. Thanks for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay,